Hello and welcome to the A to J author portion of the 2019 online document assembly training put on in partnership with Law Help Interactive, A to J author, and Capstone Practice Systems. I am Jessica Frank, A to J author's project manager. The A to J author portion of this training series is four videos long. In video one, we covered how document assembly works, how A to J author and HotDocs work together to form a completed document assembly package. This is video two. Video two will give you an overview of A to J author and basic question design. In video three, we'll cover macros, functions, repeat loops, and advanced conditions. Finally, in video four, we'll talk about the A to J author document assembly tool, also known as the A to J DAT. You can find all of the videos on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash A to J author. This is the video two in the series. We'll cover an overview of A to J author and basic question design. You create A to J guided interviews on our website, www.a2jauthor.org. To log in, go to the Author tab. If you're already logged in as, and approved as an author, you'll see the Run A to J Author button. If not, you won't see that button and you'll need to scroll down to the Login link. Click that link and you'll be taken to the page where you can log in or create an account if you don't already have one. Once you're logged in and click that Run A to J Author button, you'll be taken into the software. The first place you'll land is the Interviews tab. On this tab, you'll have the ability to create a new blank interview, see and work on all the ones you've previously created, or upload an A to J guided interview file from your local file storage. For example, if you want to work on converting an existing A to J 4 guided interview and convert it to the current version, or if you want to work on someone else's file, you can upload them to your account here. Moving through the software is done via the navigation tabs along the left-hand side of the screen. We'll walk through all the tabs from top to bottom in this video. Besides the interviews tab, all the other tabs are blank until you open up an interview. To do that, you double click on the interview name or you single click it and click the open button. The first tab is the About tab. It contains the general information and metadata for your interview, including things like the title, a description, the jurisdiction, who the author is, what version you're using, what language is controlling the interview, and a history of revisions. You can add graphics, including branding logos and ending graphics. So the branding logo would appear in the bottom right-hand corner of your interview for your end user to see. That branding logo is 120 by 120 pixels maximum. It should be uh, either a JPEG, a PNG, or a GIF file. And the ending graphic would replace the courthouse if you wanted to. That should be 900 by 250 pixels, a PNG or a SWIFT file, and make sure to use alpha transparency. There are feedback options, which allow end users to provide feedback to you. Um, in order to enable that, you have to specify an email address. Just so you know, all feedback also goes to our development team to ensure that there aren't any errors with the software itself for the end user. You can also on this tab select an avatar to be the guide for your end user. You can pick either a male or female guide avatar. You can pick from five different skin tones and eight different hair options. And then finally on this tab, you can also select the language from the interview. There are 16 languages to choose from. These languages will translate the Chrome of the interview, the things that are common to all interviews, like back, next, continue, required, um, send feedback. They don't actually translate the text of the interview questions themselves. That's dependent on the authors. The next tab down is the variables tab. In it, the variables are listed alphabetically. You can double click on the variable name to pull up the variable information window, which will allow you to edit the name and the type of the variable and also to make notes about the variable itself. The list indicates whether a variable is used in a repeat uh, dialog and what type of variable it is along with the name of the variable. And at the top in the right hand corner, you can create new variables by clicking the add button and the variable information window will open up and you can upload existing HotDocs component files, .cmp files, that contain a list of variables from HotDocs that you can then use in your A to J guided interview. 
Remember, you can't load A to J guided interviews variables into Hot Docs, but you can load Hot Docs variables into A to J author. So if you are using Hot Docs, it's best to start by creating the Hot Docs template and then working on your A to J guided interview. The next tab down in the list is the Steps tab. It acts as steps act as the main outline for your guided interview. Steps give the feeling of progressing through the A to J guided interview for your end user. On this tab, you can add new steps with the question steps drop down the number of steps. You can have up to 13 steps, 0 through 12, and each step can have an unlimited number of questions in your interview. You can click on the name of the sign to edit that step name, and you can also see that in preview mode here that when you edit the sign post, um, they change. This tab is also where you can set your interview's starting and exiting point. The starting point by default is the first question of the interview. The exit point is only used when you want to enable save and resume. You can learn more about save and resume, the feature that allows end users to exit, save their answers, and come back later to complete the interview by watching the video on exiting on our YouTube channel, which again is youtube.com slash a to j author. The fourth tab down is the Pages tab. This is where you're going to spend the majority of your time authoring. We'll focus on this tab more later on in this video, but so here's just a quick overview of the Pages tab. You could edit existing pages and add new ones here. For A to J author, the term page and question are often used interchangeably. You can open, clone, and delete pages and add pop-ups as well in the top navigation bar. You can open a question by double clicking on it or clicking it once and then clicking open. The list of pages shown are sorted by steps. The title of the page is visible along with a snippet of the text of the page and on the far right side icons that show what type of fields or help are included in that page. Steps only appear when they have questions inside them and the list of pop-ups created are at the bottom of the pages list. This is the map tab. The Map tab lets you see the forest for the trees. It's the big picture of your interview. By clicking on the pages list or the map itself, you can bring up the question design editor to edit that page. This is the Files tab. Here you can see all the files that make up your A to J guided interview. You can upload external files, JPEG, XML, PNG, MP3, and MP4. Any files you upload, you can delete as well. However, you won't be able to delete the files intrinsic to the interview itself, including guide.xml, which is used by A to J author, guide.json, which is used by the A to J viewer to play the interview for the end user, and templates.json, which is used by the A to J document assembly tool if you have A to J templates. The next tab is the All Logic tab. This lets you see and edit all the logic you've added to your interview. If you have any errors with your logic, the logic box will be read with an error message and a warning symbol. Like the map tab, this gives you the bird's eye view of your interview. You can see all the logic in one place and make any changes necessary. You can also edit your logic boxes within the question design editor, which we'll talk more about later and in video three. The all text tab lets you see and edit all the text of your interview, including field and, label bu and button labels. The preview tab lets you see your A to J guided interview as the end user will see it. This is important and used mostly for testing. The preview menus at the bottom here include edit this and resume edit, fill and debug panel. Resume edit and edit this take you back to where you entered preview mode from with resume edit or edit this takes you to the question design window for the current question if you've clicked through the interview a bit. The debug panel contains both the scripting window and the variables window. The variables window shows you all the variables in your interview and the values that are currently contained in your testing answer file. And the scripting window shows you what's going on behind the scenes of the guided interview. What page you're on, what logic is run, what buttons have been clicked, and what fields have been filled out. This tab is the report tab. The report tab contains three possible reports the full report, which loads automatically when you click the report tab, the text report, and the citation report. This is an example of the full report. It includes all of your text, all of your variables, all your logic, everything about your interview itself. If you printed it out, it'd be the full printout of your entire interview. 
It also includes a readability score at the bottom. This is an example of the text report. This only prints the text of your questions. So it doesn't include anything about the variables or any logic, only the text that would need to either be recorded for audio purposes or given to a translator for translations. It's a simplified version of the full report. This is your citation report. All of the notes and citation fields are put into one place for area easy verification of assumptions and the underlying law that can be used when updating or converting your guided interviews. Make sure to use those citation fields as an author. The citation fields are relatively new, about a year or two old, but um, the future you or the next developer on this project is going to thank you if you use those citation fields now. Make sure to document every time you make an assumption or you script logic a certain way or you rely on some outside external information. Give that information to the next person who's going to have to work on this interview by including it in a citation or a note field. The Publish tab is where you come to publish your interviews to Law Help Interactive or to download your interview files for sharing. Most commonly, you're going to want to either download the zip file and then share that with wherever, whoever you're sharing it with, or you're going to publish to LHI production site in order to get your interview up and associate it with your hot text template and made available for public consumption. Now let's talk about the question design editor. This is where all the work happens. As I said before, the majority of the time spent off authoring is going to be in the Pages tab. This is where you can edit existing pages, create new pages, and create and edit pop-ups. Questions appear in the Pages tab alphanumerically by step. That isn't necessarily how the end user will travel through the interview. How the interview flows for your end user is dictated by the button destinations or logic go-to statements. On this tab, steps only appear when they have questions in them so you may not see all your steps at first. As you create new questions and move them into subsequent steps, those steps will show up on the Pages tab. This is the question design window. You'll become very familiar with this screen. This is where you will script your questions, create fields, edit buttons, and script advanced logic statements. For the question design editor, it's all about the scroll. All the work of authoring happens in this one screen. To access all the features, just scroll through the question design window. Starting at the top, we have the step number assigned to this page. This is where you can move a page from one step to another. Then there's the name of the page. The notes section is for author's eyes only. It won't be seen by the end user, but it will be included in the citation report and the full report. Under that is the question text section. That's where you type the text of your question. Then there's the text citation field and the text audio. You can upload MP3 files to your question that read the question text for the end user. This is less helpful now because Ada J Author underwent an accessibility audit in 2018 and is WCAG 2.0 compliant through level A and soon to be level triple A. Users who require a screen reader can now more easily use an A to J guide interview with their preferred reader instead of authors needing to add audio clips manually. Under that is the learn more prompt field. This is the question the end user avatar has that prompts the response from the guide avatar. Learn mores are just in time learning features that allow you to give your end user additional information at the point in which they need it. In a learn more, it is displayed in a question and answer format. The end user avatar thinks the prompt and the user clicks learn more to see the response or help. The help style, that's the reply the guide avatar can give, can be text, audio, a graphic, a video, or a combination. By default, the help is text, but by selecting the help style drop-down menu, you can change that to a show me graphic or a show me video. If you select either of those options, an upload field will pop up for you to add content to. The help field is the text reply for the learn more from the guide avatar. There's also a help citation field and help audio if you want to upload audio to the learn more. Before we scroll further down the question design window, here are the text editing options for your question text. You can embolden, italicize, or underline. You can add a block quote, indent, outdent, add bullet lists, and numbered lists. You can create hyperlinks and unlink them as well. Finally, you can associate a pop-up with a word or phrase in your question text. 
Remember, pop-ups are used to provide just-in-time definitions for legal terms or other difficult words. If we keep scrolling down in the question text section, we get to the counting variable field and the checkbox for nested repeat loops. The counting variable field is used for repeat loops and the nested loop checkbox is only used when you want to do nested repeat loops. Nested repeat loops are one of the most complicated things you can do in A to J Author and they won't be covered in this video series. If you're interested in them, there's a training video on nested repeat loops on our YouTube channel and a sample exercise to practice them under the Learn tab on our website, www.adajauthor.org. The next section after the question text is the field section. Fields are ways to collect information from your end user. You can have up to nine fields per question and each one can be a different field type or the same. We'll talk about the field types in a bit. Here, is, here in this screenshot is a basic overview of a field. There's a type, a label, that's what displays to the end user before the field, like name or date of birth. Every field needs to have a variable associated with it. A to J author has to have some place to put the user's answers in that field. If you don't add a variable, A to J author will create a blank default one, which will cause documents not to assemble in hot docs. So make sure every field has its own variable. Under the variable tab is the default value. This will display to the end user as a pre-selected option, but they can change it if they want. For example, if you want to pre-select the state for the user's address, you can do that here. You can make the field required in that the user must answer it before they move on or not with the required checkbox shown here. For text variables, you can enter a maximum character count. You can change the default error message and you can add a sample value. The sample value is just used for testing purposes. You add it here to the field, then when you're in preview mode, click the fill button and it will pre-fill that sample value as you test. Here's some additional information about fields. Each field type has different limitations you can impose on the user's input. So we had maximum characters for field, for text field types, but here you can see that date ranges can be limited by a minimum and a maximum, and so can number field types as well. In number field types, you can limit them by a min and a max, and it also prevents the user from entering things that are not numbers. You can attach external lists, which are XML files, to create a drop-down list for your end user to choose from. A common one shown here is the US States one. We created that XML list for you to download. It's available under the New User Resources under the Learn tab on our website. It has the states listed by full name alphabetically for the end user, but the two-digit postal code is what's saved in the answer file. You can also create internal lists by typing in the first item, then adding a hard return, that's generally the enter key on most keyboards, between each subsequent item. There are 14 field types available for you to choose from. They're pretty straightforward and easy to decide which one is most appropriate for your question. Some have shadow prompts so the end user enters the data the correct way. So for example, phone number or social security number show the way in which the end user should enter that data. Some have data restrictions built in, like the date field requires that the user type in in the American style of dates, the month, month, slash day, day, slash year, 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 or pick from the calendar provided. There's additional information about each field type in our authoring guide found on the website under the Learn tab. Next, we have the button section. Buttons are how you move an end user from one question to the next. The button has a label. That's what the user sees on the button itself. The button can have a variable, but doesn't have to, and the button can assign that variable a value if the user clicks it. The destination is the next question if the user hits the button. Different buttons can have different destinations. Then there are the repeat loop options, which we'll cover in video three. In the buttons section, new questions by default only have one button, the continue button but you can have up to three buttons on a screen and you can use buttons instead of fields for questions with three options or less. So are you the petitioner or the respondent? Um, are you married? Yes or no? Remember the maximum button though, number of buttons is three per question and you can label the buttons however you'd like. Here's what a button can do. It can assign a value to a variable. It can take the end user to another question 
or it can set and increment counting variables, which we'll talk about in the repeat loop section in video three. When you select a destination question, the pop-up drop-down list will include other questions you've made, back to prior question, which is a special A to J button, success process form, which should be used only once at the end of the interview as the get my document or submit button. There's a couple other exiting functions and one will allow you to exit your user to a website if they don't qualify or they aren't appropriate to use the form. Here's an example of the pop-up drop-down list of all of your destination pages. And you can see that any pages you've already created are shown. If you keep scrolling, you'll get the exiting options and the special A to J pages. The final section in the question design editor is the advanced logic section. We'll cover more of this in video three, but here's a quick overview. You can script if else statements that will run either before the user sees the question or after the user presses one of the buttons on the page. There's also the logic citation section. Remember to use that to leave breadcrumb notes for the next developer, whether it's future you or someone else. Tell them why you scripted the logic the way you, you did. For example, if the logic is if income and you is greater than 25,000, do whatever. Explain why you use 25,000. Was it 125% of the poverty guidelines in the year you created the interview? Was it based on an internal memo that set income limits for your legal aid organization? Whatever it is, make it easy to check later that those values are still valid. There are five commands that you'll need to know if you want to script logic in A to J author. If, else, go to, set, and end if. All if statements must have an end if, just like every sentence has to have a capital letter and punctuation, every logic statement has to have an if and an end if. Each logic statement command must be on its own line. That's a hard return between each of these commands. But remember, not all interviews need logic. You can have a complete interview that uses just fields and branching via buttons. You don't have to use logic to have a complete interview. Now let's talk about the overall design of questions. So this is big picture when you're drafting your questions or you're um, talking to your subject matter expert about how to ask what needs to be asked to complete the form. Keep your audience and your goal in mind. Include instructions on how to complete the form. What's the end user going to need in order to answer the questions that you're going to ask? Group like questions together. So the form itself may not ask all about the spouse's information in one section. It might be spread across three pages. But you can group all the questions together about the spouse in one, one step, about the children in another step, about their property in a third step. You control the order of the questions within the guided interview. It's completely independent of how the form structures it. Give context to each set of questions as you move from one topic to the next. Explain to your end user in the beginning page of a step that you are finished with one step and you're now moving on to X topic. This allows them to get in the proper mindset to answer the questions and to know what the context is before they move on. Begin with easy and safe questions. So don't start out on the first one with, um, tell me all of the convictions you had or why are you late on your child support? Begin with easy questions and then move into the more difficult ones. Build confidence in the tool before you um, dig deep for an end user. The goal for most A to J guided interviews is between a fifth and seventh grade reading level. You wanna use bold, but use it sparingly. So think about one word or one item per question. You want to balance interesting question formats, but what you want to have it with consistency there. So there are 14 different question formats plus the buttons. You want to be able to keep it interesting by not using the same question type over and over again, but you don't have to use all 14 in one interview. And it's always good to use images in a learn more section. As I said before, an image is worth a thousand words. And so it's very helpful to end users to include any sort of graphic or image that might help them answer the question in a learn more. Now let's talk about the order of the questions themselves. At the beginning of the interview, you should have a checklist of the things the user needs. If they're going to need their spouse's W-2 and the information about their children's school, make sure they know that right away so that they can get that information and come back with it if they don't have it right away. You want to include instructions on how to use the interview. That includes instructions on what to do to actually get their documents. Um, how do they get from the A to J guide interview to the printout of 
their documents, but it also can include instructions on what to do once they have the printout. So are they going to have to make several copies? Are they going to have to serve it? Are they going to have to file it? What happens after they're done with the interview? Those can all be printed and included with um, their documents as well at the end. You want to get any qualification or eligibility questions out of the way in the beginning. You don't want someone to spend 60 minutes filling out an interview to find out they make too much money or they're not in the right county or this isn't the right form for them. So make sure if you're going to kick someone out, kick them out early. And then include the hook. Explain why somebody is going to spend 30 to 60 minutes. What are they going to get out of it at the end? So the hook can be as simple as, at the end, when you complete this interview, you're going to get all of the paperwork you need necessary to do whatever. With questions, you want to start off neutral and get harder. So you've hooked them, you've given them the checklist, and now you're going to start off slow and then build to those harder questions if need be. This is also an opportunity for advocacy. So the form may require that their social security number is on it, but you know that most of your end users are likely going to be on uh, library or court kiosks. You don't want that sort of sensitive information potentially available in the browser for the next person. You can explain to the end user in a question at the end that they need to handwrite in their social security number but you don't have to ask for it in the question itself, in the interview itself. So that's an opportunity for advocacy to ensure that your end user is protecting themselves as much as possible when using this. With individual questions, you want to script them in a way that evokes the truth, accommodate all possible answers, allow for an I don't know or an other, make sure not to make any questions ambiguous, and be careful about assuming what a user would know. Just because you would know what county you live in doesn't necessarily mean that someone who is filling this out on a court kiosk is stressed out, um, is late for their court date, whatever it is, um, would know that information. So add in all the things you can to make it easier for them. If it's a county lookup by your state uh, website or if it's a postal code lookup based on um, their address on usps.gov, anything extra you can give the end user to make this process as easy as possible, you should add that in. Questions should not rely on previous questions. If you need to rely on a previous question, use a macro to remind the end user. And we'll talk about macros in video three about how you can call up information they've already given you and display it back to the end user. And always be careful not to use leading language when you are asking questions. Finally, plain language and readability. You want to write for your audience. So consider their age, education, culture, their first language. Um, you as the subject matter expert or your subject matter expert, if you are the developer, um, will know who is generally going to use this form and what sort of typical situation they are um, and use that information to benefit them. You want to use familiar words and phrasing, but if you have to use specialized terms, explain them with pop-ups. So pop-ups give you the ability to define legal terms if you have to use them. So you should use pop-ups as much as possible. Use the active voice, direct address, avoid foreign, archaic, or noun-heavy phrasing. Boil it down for your end user. Um, if you can make it easier or smoother for them by saying it in fewer words, do that. But plain language isn't always just eliminating uh, surplus words. If you want to learn more about plain language, you can check out writeclearly.org's plain language online course, which is available at the URL below, um, to check out how that is, um, how you can practice those plain language skills. The next two A to J author classes in the 2019 online training series with Law Help Interactive are October 3rd, which will cover macros, functions, repeat loops, and advanced logic, and October 30th, which will be A to J uh, document assembly tool. That's video three and video four in this series. If you aren't part of the 2019 training series and you're just watching these videos, you can just watch video three and video four after this one. If you have any questions, you can always reach out to me. It's jessica at cali.org. Thank you for watching video two and happy authoring.